Thank you. you can, can you hear me okay? All right. Lots of questions yesterday I didn't answer. I want to just kind of quickly look over. I like to have the references of stuff and when I don't know them. So yesterday there was a question about the thorn in the flesh. I want you guys to just do this with me. Can I erase some of this stuff? Turn to uh, Numbers 33, 55, 56. So Numbers 33, 55, 58, uh, 56, sorry. And let's have somebody else turn to Joshua 23. Eleven through thirteen. Um, and then Judges two. Two through three. The last one is Ezekiel twenty-eight, twenty-four. All right. Who's got numbers 33? Huh? Let's see. We're going to read it out loud. you got the microphone here. But if you fail to drive out the people who live in the land, those who remain will be like splinters in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will harass you in the land where you live and will do to you what I have planned to do to them. Okay, read it again. A little slower. I want you guys to hear the content. Do you guys know the law first mention? You ever heard that principle, the law first mention? To get an understanding of like what biblical worship is, what you do is you go and you find the first place that word is mentioned in scripture and that establishes a precedent for what that word means. For example, the word worship has very little to do with singing songs. In the Old Covenant it is shaka, which means to bow down. It has way more to do with the posture of your heart than it has to do with what comes out of your lips. Right? Proscunio in the New Covenant means to bow down with a kiss. So you can be singing all you want and never actually worshiping the Lord. Dang, that's a good word. Okay, so this is what's, let's look at the context. Um, I think a question was asked about what about Paul's thorn in the flesh. So let's go into the scripture. What I'm trying to present to you with biblical theology and is what if we would stop all the filters, the filters, the filters, the filters, like Calvinism, dispensationalism, and all these other filters that have been around for so long that you don't even realize you have them, and just say, I'm going to read the scripture and let scripture interpret scripture. I'll tell you one of the things that's going to happen. One of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be certain questions that you will have that will never be answered. In the Hebraic mindset, they're okay with living with a certain sense of mystery. In the Greek mindset, we have to figure everything out. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. So, let's just look at what the Bible says a thorn in the flesh is, instead of making up something that it never says it does. All right? Um, so, jo read it again. Numbers 33, 56, 50, 55, 56. Read it again. A little slower and louder. But if you fail to drive out the people who live in the land, those who remain will be like splinters in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will harass you in the land where you live, and I will do to you what I plan to do to them. Joshua 23, 11 through 13. Who has that? So be very careful to love the Lord your God, but if you turn away from him and cling to the customs of the survivors of these nations remaining among you, and if you, were to, if you intermarry with them... Then know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive them out of your land. Instead, they will be a snare and a trap to you, a whip for your backs, and a thorn, a thorny brambles in your eyes, and it will vanish from this good land that the Lord your God has given you. I want to read it out of the uh, Eugene Peterson's message translation. I believe that's what I have. <coughs> now, diligently guard your souls, love God, your God, because if you wander off and start taking up with these remaining nations still among you, intermarry, say, and have other dealings with them, know for certain that God your God will not get rid of these nations for you, There'll be nothing but trouble to you. Horse whips on your back and sand in your eyes. What's that called? Do we do, we do that in our English language? Huh? Do we say he's not the sharpest tool in the toolbox? What are those called? 
figures of speech. Somehow, crazy how, I don't know how, instead of just reading the scripture in context and seeing what is a thorn in their flesh so far. So far you've read two verses. Let's read more. Okay. <laughs> Judges 2. <laughs> Judges 2, 2 to 3. For your part, you were not to make any covenant with the people living in this land. Instead, you were to destroy their altars. But you disobeyed my command. Why did you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. They will be torn in your sides, and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. Just, just starting to unpack a little bit? Yeah. Is God giving them sickness? Yes. Huh? So it's really... Is God giving these guys sickness? No. What's happening? It's an annoyance. It's an annoyance. Just like a messenger sent from Satan to buffet him, maybe it means exactly what it says. See? That's called Bible interpretation. Instead of, I don't understand what it means, let me open up a commentary from the 1700s, and the guy all of a sudden develops his theology, and we teach it as if it is sound doctrine. Then if anybody veers from it, it's like, oh, heresy. Let the word of God interpret the word of God. That's all I'm, that's all I'm suggesting to you. Let's do one more verse. Ezekiel 28, 24. Ezekiel 28, 24. No longer will Israel's scornful neighbors prick and tear at her like thorns and briars, for then they will know that I am the sovereign Lord. Okay, so yesterday the question was asked. It's a great question. Um, I'm not ever annoyed by the questions, but just how some of the theologies are formed, I just kind of I get baffled. Um, remember, I didn't grow up in the church. I got saved by hearing the audible voice of God call me. I began to read the scriptures. They became alive to me. I didn't have Bible school. I was launching the international ministry, and I, I had to really get hungry for the word. It wasn't until later when I started to be part of local churches that I started to recognize there was denominational influence where the theologies were all different. And I thought, I thought there was only one interpretation for this stuff. And that's why if you guys as Bible students, be very, very careful not to... Um, be open to like, maybe this verse means this. Maybe it means this. Now we know that there's no private interpretation. However, we want to be careful to not be super arrogant about it. Right? Then you're no longer teachable. Okay, so any other questions on the thorn of the flesh after those verses? I want to answer this other one that was asked. I made a joke about it, uh, but out of Second Samuel no, no, no. Okay. What is it? Which ones you had a question on? Second Samuel 24, 1, right? Yeah. This was one of those in your reading that was like, what? Is God sending them to do a census and then gets mad at them and sends a plague? And then later it says Satan sent them to do a census? You guys know what I'm talking about now? Yeah. Okay, now, how many of you are using other translations to study? Okay, <laughs> let's stop there. When someone asks me a, a question about scripture, depending if I'm lazy or not, that feeling lazy that day or not, I'll look up something like uh, uh, blue letter bible.org. There's another Bible, I think it's dash hub.org. And I'll go to something called an interlinearity, and it'll have the Greek word here, and then it'll have the actual definition, love. Right? That's, that's not really what it is. And then I'll try to read it in its original text to see what it says. Okay? And then if I'm still not getting an understanding, I like to read out of the NASB. Does anybody know where the NASB Swings on its, she's got the NASB. The NASB is called Greeklish. Have you ever heard that term? 
It's Greeklish. It doesn't read as smoothly as the New Living translation. Um, the, the New Living is one of, it's a great translation to read out of, to just kind of what's really going on there. But the, this is the most, um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say accurate. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. If I'm preaching, and let's say I'm preaching at the corporate service, and someone is interpreting for me in Spanish or Korean or another language, okay? Do you guys understand the difference between interpretation and translation? Yeah. What's the difference? Well, it's not the person that's interpreting it, like their, their culture and their personality and their, all If you were to literally take Spanish and interpret it literally, it would, it would sound ridiculous in English because some of the sentence structure is backwards. Does that make sense? OK, so this is Greeklish. So it's a more literal translation. So the academic level is a little bit higher to kind of understand. I, I love all of these books, OK? Then you have, in the middle here, NIV. The NIV is a really good translation. People pick on the NIV all the time because it's always omitting things. Um, other than that, <clears throat> it's, it's pretty solid. Um, NIV is really easy to read, really easy to study. And I would say most people, how many of you guys have an NIV? Not, not that many, I'm surprised. But this is probably the most common, I would say. Then over here, you have the NLT, which is like a paraphrase. I would put it here. I'd put the message over here. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I like the message. But first, uh, you know, and also one of the ones that maybe, maybe you'd put it over here somewhere. A lot of people hate the Amplified, but what I'm doing when I'm studying something is I will move through these books depending on what I'm looking for, all right? So now that you guys have all the resources right on your computer, um, once in a while, I'll take a scripture reference like this one here we're talking about, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David, capital he, right? Is it a capital he in your NLTs? So, let me, let me read you this thing I found. The translators of the New King James Version believe that he in this sentence applies to God because they capitalized it. Yet in 1 Chronicles 21.1 tells us, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. The best explanation is that Satan moved David and is the he. So that's why in your NLT and in your NIV and in almost every other translation, it's a lowercase e because it's talking about Satan. And you'll have to deal with that with the author. <laughs> that's, you know, that's their, how they're, I don't know how to answer that one. But yeah. so what I just did there was I, I read the scripture reference through a different translation. And I thought, what's the problem? It's obvious who it is. But if you're reading it from one translation, you're going to be s stuck on that capital. Yeah. Um, if you have a MacBook, you could download for free, I believe, Eloquent Sword. And it's basically what he's talking about, eloqu eloquent sword. If you have a regular uh, computer, you can use uh, eSword. eSword, yeah. eSword, it helps with Bible study and meaning of words. Eloquent? I think it's e dash sword, isn't it? I believe so, yes. So for, wait, for the MacBook, it's eloquent? Eloquent. It's Cinco de Mayo, I'm kind of in the mood right now. So I'll read you another a commentary I found. Now the he there we assume would be the Lord. But as we find out in First Chronicles chapter 1, it was Satan that moved David's heart to the numbering of the people. So God opened the door and allowed Satan to move in and tempt David. Cool? Cool. Not cool, but... All right. Now, we are going to dive into, honestly, the book I was the most nervous to teach. And... Uh, <laughs> The Song of Songs. Glad you guys are all excited about it. Oh, wait. Okay, let me just break this down here really quickly. Um, I have so many notes here, goodness gracious. 
we have what's called the natural interpretation of the Song of Solomon. And here, here's what I want you to hear. One of the things that I'm trying to do, and I am definitely biased, but what I'm trying to do, and every Bible teacher you're going to have is going to be biased, right? If you have a guy that stands up here and they're preaching, that they're doing it because they believe what they're teaching is true, or they shouldn't be doing it, right? But what, what I really appreciated about my academic learning was I didn't go to a, a Bible school that was just one denomination. So I wasn't just learning one dispensation, one, I'm sorry, one filter. I actually had a teacher that would teach and say, these are the three, four different views. You know who's really good at this? Wayne Grudem. Wayne Grudem Systematic Theology. He does a good job with saying, this is the different way people view, and this is how I view it. I don't agree with all the ways that he views it either. However, I so appreciate what he does. Does that make sense? I love that. This is the way Pentecostals believe. I don't believe this. This is the way these believe. I, I really enjoy that. So <clears throat> what I want to propose to you is this. The natural interpretation, the scripture does have a context. That's what we've been talking about, right? So one of your questions I think that you guys have to answer is, what did the first audience hear? What the original audience hear? Is that, is that how it goes? The original listeners? Do you think that when the original listeners read the Song of Solomon, they pictured themselves as the bride? No. <laughs> Do you think that they pictured that it was an allegory between Israel and Yahweh? No, I think they were reading the Song of Solomon, which is a song that Solomon wrote to, I believe, his first wife. So if you want to look at the original understanding, it says what it is, right? Now, the allegorical view is another view, and it's a solid view, and I'm not trying to discredit the allegorical view. <laughs> but <laughs> my problem with some of the allegorical view is the hermeneutic. Like, you can make up any symbol you want and make it mean something. And if you actually really study the allegorical views, like I was mentored by a pastor who wrote a, a, key, um, a verse by verse study on the Song of Solomon. So my introduction was Song of Solomon as allegorical view. And some of the real hard verses, they just kind of skip over or make the weirdest, weirdest, weirdest uh, suggestions of what they mean. Do you have a question already? Yeah, can you just explain what hermeneutic is? Hermeneutic is a way to interpret how you interpret your scriptures, right? And we have to have a consistent one. Let me give you an example. Some, some streams, they will take Song of Solomon as being allegory, and they'll take Revelation as being literal. That's an inconsistent hermeneutic. And we're moving on. Praise the Lord for that one. Okay. <clears throat> natural interpretation. This view depicts a, na a natural love story between principles that honor the beauty of love within marriage. This view has grown in popularity in the last hundred years. This is a note I took from someone that has an allegorical view. Actually, if you study church history further back than a hundred years, what you'll find is a lot of weirdness around the Song of Solomon. Who knows who a guy named Augustine is? What can you tell me about Augustine? Or Augustine or Augustine? Huh? Yeah. Confessions of Augustine. What else? See, pretty important in the formulization of modern doctrine. The answer is absolutely. Doesn't mean it was all good, though. Augustine was mentored before he got saved. He was a student of Platonic theory, which was Greek philosophy. And there were certain things that Augustine could not embrace in Christianity until he saw some of the similarities with Platonic theory and Christianity, one being that God is like the sun. He's immovable. He's impassable. He's immutable. He's timeless. He can't be changed. He has no emotions. That's exactly what Platonic theory thought. Okay? Now, who knows a little bit about Augustine's past? He was fairly promiscuous. She's being very nice. 
<laughs> Augustine struggled with lust. Even after his conversion, he talks about his struggles. So the Song of Solomon to these guys became like, ugh. So they had requirement, like ages when you could read the Song of Solomon. And some said you had to be 30, 30 years old. Some said you had to be 18 years old. And it was all awkward around the Song of Solomon. Why would they treat the book like that if it was just an allegory? The allegorical view came later. And it came later because people don't want to talk about the fruit that the Shunammite tasted. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. And to get that context, you got to like really swing for the fences. Now, it preaches better though. Who knows about a guy named Origen? These guys are all infallible, right? No, they were not infallible. They were brilliant. They loved God. They were discovering truth. But these guys were some of our foundation guys. What can you tell me about Origen? <laughs> she knows. Uh, oil? Why don't you just tell us? Origen's an early church father after John's disciples who took his testicles and smashed them with a rock. Oh. Yay! So now, oh, that hurts. This, is, this is early church. Yeah, I know. I don't want to say it. That's Origen. So what was formed out of some of the powerful truths that are coming here was something that we call, and I think you guys have heard of this before, Gnostic dualism. Anybody know what Gnostic dualism means? <laughs> Listen, you come up here and teach. Anybody else except for the smart girl on the right over there? What do you think? Not the, the, I don't know if I want you to answer. I was like bonded with you in the beard. Yeah, good. So, so spirit, spirit good, and then what'd you say? Flesh, okay. Body, bad. You know who was one of the most modern proponents of this theology? Who we all just love? I mean, I love his books too, but I don't agree with a lot of his stuff. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> he would be considered a liberal theologian. Okay, moving on. It would be a guy named Watchman Nee. Who's heard of Watchman oh, Nee? Yeah. Watchman Nee. So now, listen. <sighs> Track with me. You do not have to agree with what I'm going to say to you. All right? Does that help you take a breath and feel, and feel safe that I'm not just going to come in like a wrecking ball? You see what I did there? See what I did there? OK. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, and I always get it wrong. I want to say it's 23, but it says, be sanctified, Holy Spirit, soul, and body, right? OK, so we have a spirit. We are spirit, we live in a soul. Backtrack there. We are spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body, right? That, that good? Okay. So here's what happened. What's it say in Hebrews 4.12? Oh, guys, you're in a Bible school. Huh? The word of the Lord is powerful. It's living and active. It's powerful, right? And then what does it do? Turn there. This is a good one. Okay. So it divides the spirit from the flesh, the joints from the marrows. Now, that word divide is the word in question. Here's the traditional way that it's been taught. That spirit is here, right? And the word of the Lord divides between soul, body, and flesh. Because Watchman Nee taught that the flesh was in the body and the soul. That's traditional, right? That, all of you have grown up believing? Yeah. This, is, this is traditional theology. Now, the word divide, instead of being a sword that goes this way, actually is a sword that goes this way. And it divides between the spirit and the spirit, between the soul and the soul, and between the body and the body, like a shish kebab. 
A little bit different than dividing yourself up. Greek understanding, all of us, if you try to study spirit, soul, and body, you're going to hear your spirit is that part that's connected to God, your soul is your mind, will, and your emotions, and your body is the temple, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Now, I like that we're trying to define it. The problem with that, making definition so simple, is in Leviticus it says the, um, the life is in the blood. Have you ever heard that verse? Yeah. Okay, who knows what the word life is in the Hebrew? Life is the word soul. So if the same Hebrew word for life and soul is in the blood, then where's your soul? Wherever the blood touches, there's your soul. So what we try to do, our Greek understanding, is we want little lists and little boxes and little structures. What I'm presenting to you is if this is a human, oh, I'm terrible at drawing and sometimes I draw bad things by accident and uh, I die. Yeah, I won't tell you the story. <laughs> this is Ivan. This is me. What we like to do is we like to say, this is his soul. This is his body. This is his spirit. Well, what I want to propose to you is that, look, I'm balding. I am, actually. Look. Looks like, like Dr. Phil a little bit. Okay, all right. Um, so I want to propose to you that this is me. And I have, and this is my spirit. And this is my soul. But you can't separate me. The Hebraic understanding is a holistic. You are fullness, not spirit, soul, body. It's all of you. This type of teaching causes people to right? And you're, everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. But people that really embrace this have struggle with self-hatred. Because we still believe that Romans 7, Paul is talking about a struggle that is presently happening in his life. In the very first line, Paul says, I speak to those, I speak to Jews. What's the context? Those under the law. I speak to those under the law. Who's under the law? I speak to those under the law. What Paul is doing in Romans chapter 7 is a writing style called the historical present. It's called the historical present. It's like this one time. It was like uh, I was newly married, so uh, maybe I was 24 years old. And um, you know, I told you guys stories of how I've done martial arts my whole life, and I just like to stay active, and um, it's just it's fun for me. And this one time I went into to judo class, and um, and, you know, my geese, like when I, went, when I got in full-time ministry, I gained 50 pounds. I was a middleweight champion, 155 pounds. I used to be able to see my feet. And um, ministry, everybody wants to have you over for dinner. And it's, you know, and I could say no, but I got to work on that self-control thing. And I'm uh, working on it. So uh, my gi pants were just a little bit tighter than they used to fit. And uh, I go to judo class, and I am grappling with one of the black belts there. And my back is like this, and I'm grappling. Now, that is the door and the chairs, and there was a class, a children's class, that was leaving. So we're just kind of working out before class starts. And as I'm grappling with this guy, all of a sudden I get a gentle tap on my shoulder, sir, your pants are ripped. And so I reach back like this, but, but, hmm, interesting. <laughs> However, would have been a better pause. However, it wasn't a little rip, the whole part blew out, and let's just say, I didn't have certain things on under. And so I am just wrestling, and the parents, and I look up, and I grab, and all the women, it's mostly the moms there. <laughs> and so I turn around, and I, and, I, and I clinch, and there's mirrors all behind me. <laughs> And I never went back to that place again. <laughs> what I just did now was historical present. I told you a story in the past, and I made you feel like it was happening. That's what's happening in Romans 7. Romans chapter 6, dead, 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 dead. 
Romans 8, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. No more condemnation. Romans 7, he's still struggling. It's called the historical present. Now, there are other views on that, right? And that's why when we were talking earlier, now you understand why I'm saying stop concentrating only on your sin all the time. Is sin bad? Yes, it's bad. And I remember, I remember when I was just newly saved, I was really struggling, and, and all of a sudden I was praying, and I felt like I was here, sin was here, and God was there. I said, like, God, deliver me. Take this thing away from me, God. And all of a sudden I have vision, and the Lord is standing here next to me, and he's saying, I want to help you take this thing out of your life. I thought, whoa. You mean my sin really was put on the cross, and now I have access to the Father? And now he's going to work with me and to remove these things in my heart. That's why the church still acts like orphans. Because we don't know who we are. Because we're still wrestling with, oh, he's so far from, he lives in you. It's a new covenant with better promises. Right? So some of these teachings all connect. And so now if the flesh, what does the Bible say happened to the flesh? What does it say in Galatians 2.20? I, now, in the King James translation, it says, I am, I am crucified. In the King James. And then in Romans 6, when it says uh, something about being dead to sin, it, it says, it says a, like a present tense. The new King James later corrects it, and every other translation corrects it. But because of the King James translation, there's a doctrine that was formed out of that talking about how you're always struggling with your flesh. But if you search all throughout the scripture, every scripture points to have been past tense, have been past tense, buried in baptism, old man's crucified, the old man's dead, okay? How many of you heard it said, and if you say this, and if a teacher said this, uh, forgive me, I'm not trying to be offensive, but maybe it'll shift your thinking. How many of you heard it said, you have two dogs in you, a white dog and a black dog. Which is the dog that gets stronger? The one you feed. That's wonderful Buddhism. It's wonderful Native American religion. It's terrible Christianity. The scripture talks about that we have been circumcised. Can we talk like adults? You guys know what it means to be circumcised? Yeah. It's to cut the head, the flesh off the head. Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> Is this, is this something, is this a one-time event or is this a process? Thank you, Jesus. Some of you are going ahead of me. Don't go ahead of me. We'll end up in the same place. I just go there differently. Baptism, one-time event or process? Okay, because if not, you're drowning people. So where people instantly freak out is they go, wait a minute. Are you saying that there's no sanctification? I believe that sanctification is a person and a process. But I believe that what the scripture teaches is that we have to be renewed to who we already are. Yes. Yes. This is the war. Amen. It's here, Romans 12, 1. Yes. Therefore I beseech you now, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. This is your reasonable act of worship. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Blah, 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 blah. You get it, right? Okay, yes. so... This wrestling with the flesh. I want to just define this very quickly. Am I saying, number one, am I saying that I don't sin? I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, that's not where my identity is. What people will ask is they'll say, if you don't believe in a flesh nature anymore, you just believe that you have one nature in Christ, which the scripture says, new creation, um, then, then are you saying that you can't sin? Adam and Eve sinned in the garden before they had a flesh nature. So you can sin, but it's hard because it's not your new creation. Let me ask you a question. Have you, ever got, have you ever watched what happens in winter with the animals? How they just naturally know how to store things up or the sp they store things up, they, they migrate. How do they know how to do that? It's in their nature. You have a new nature in Christ Jesus. Now, I do believe this. When you read the scripture, it uses this word. Put on Christ, put off the deeds of the flesh. 
I believe in the deeds of the flesh. I believe that we can still wrestle with the deeds of the flesh. Now, is this semantics? I don't think so. Put on, the word put on Christ, put on this word. I'm not sure why they chose put. Because if you look it up, it's sink into. Now stop and think about what I just said. That is powerful. When the scripture says, put on the new man, put on Christ, it's saying, sink into. Ooh. That changed my life right there. So then put off, put off means to cast off. If you're anything like me, I got saved when I was 20 and I had lived a lifestyle. I lived in the world. I was born again. I was baptized in water. The old man was crucified. That does not mean that I don't still have memories of the past, of things that I've done. And so, instead of, I am a sinner, inherit all in me now. I, no, the deeds of the flesh are this. The enemy knows how to uh, bring up memories and, and, and whisper lies. Now, Let's imagine that you guys that have work duties where you're, you're doing construction or whatever, or, or you're, you're getting dirty, and you go in your room and you take your clothes and you throw them to, to the side, okay? Now, you can choose to put on those dirty clothes or put them off. Are you there? That's your choice. I would say put them off. All right? So now, this teaching, I still get to the same conclusion that, yes, we wrestle. There is still a wrestle. But I'm not constantly trying to kill myself. The only time you see in Scripture where it says, I die daily, we take it out of context, and Paul is saying, I risk, myself, I risk my life daily for the preaching of the gospel. Do you guys know that verse? So what does it mean to, to go there really quickly? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So instead of trying to die all the time, I want to encourage you to live. Because you have a new creation in Christ. Let's go to 1 Corinthians um, it's 15. It talks about the dogs at Epaphrata and all that. If you find it before me, just let me know. Here it is. Um, and why, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 30. And why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? For I swear to your brothers and sisters that I face death daily. This is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you. And what value is there in fighting wild beasts, those people of Ephesus? Be, do you get it? What, is it? what is the context of that scripture that says I die daily? Paul's literally saying, I risk my life daily for the preaching of the gospel. That's what he's literally saying. So good old King James, God bless it. A whole theology was birthed out of it, and we just trapped it in our mind, and that's what we teach for, for forever and ever and ever. And then when you hear truth, it's like, whoa, that is, I am wrestling with that. No, you really are a new creation in Christ. Old things really have passed away. Does that mean you can sin? Yeah, but it's pretty stupid. You shouldn't do that. All right? So now, what I just laid a foundation for, which seemed like a rabbit trail, was Gnostic dualism is rooted in this thing of everything spiritual is good. This is where we see Catholic priests not marrying. The Desert Fathers. Some of those books are actually really fun to read because they had all these miracles that happened and stuff. But that doesn't mean their theology was right. If they had pain in their side, they would lie on the pain on the side because they were suffering the sufferings of Christ. <laughs> no, he suffered so you don't have to in that way. He gives and takes away. Yeah, he gives you Jesus and takes away your sin. Just define suffering. When Paul defines suffering, he's getting rocks thrown at him. He's getting stoned and beat and whipped, right? What we've interpreted somehow is God giving him sickness, and that is such a hard way to translate that. 
not just because of my stance, just because of all the scriptures you look at. You go, where do you get that from? Oh, oh, we say, well, you know, he, uh, he had to leave this person, de you know, he, on his missionary journey, he left someone sick. He's not Jesus. Everyone who came to Jesus, he healed. Jesus is perfect theology. So what would suffering look like for us? Now, for most of you, it's different because of the places that maybe you'll go on missions. But for most American Christians, it looks like persecuted on Facebook. <laughs> right? All of a sudden, you're on a website somewhere because you believe in healing or something. So there will, there will be persecution for your faith. There will be suffering. But we have to understand what suffering means in Scripture. That Calvinistic view has all of you believing that everything that happens is God. And you've got to really start to think about that. Those children that are being molested, that's God's will, if that's what you believe. That is not our Father. Yes? Uh, what does sanctification look like to you there? Sanctification, I believe, is the renewing of the mind. The Bible talks of the fruit of holiness. So the gifts of the Spirit are given. Woof! But fruit grows. Right? So you are growing and maturing in character. You're growing in love. You're growing in patience. You're growing. So I believe the more we begin to understand our identity, the more we begin to live as the way God calls us to. If we're constantly struggling, that's just rooted in an orphan spirit. It's a lack of understanding who our Father is and who we are in Him. Yeah. Can you contrast this approach, uh, contrast sanctification, the like about sanctification, this approach versus someone with a I'm not sure if I could do that well, uh, to be honest. I'll just tell you what I heard when I grew up in the church. Sanctification looked like this. You're, you know what? You're, you're just a sinner. And uh, I got more faith that you're just going to struggle with sin your whole life. Instead of I have more faith in God that he's going to deliver you. And it was this constant, 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 you know, you guys, struggling with porn again. So here's what we got to do. Take your computer and smash it on the floor because that's really going to change your heart. doesn't change your heart. So now, holiness becomes everything you do on the outside. Right? How you dress, how you talk, how you behave, and it's behavior modification instead of being an inner working of the Holy Spirit. Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies. On the inside, it's the difference between religion. Religion is external control. Some of you have been raised like this, so you don't know the difference. Religion, external control. You ever hear of a hovering parent? Johnny, where are you, Johnny? Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? Whose house are you going to sleep over? Where are you going? I got to go. <laughs> and they're like, the kid falls. Open, pick him up. So you're going to put the kid in the bubble. Right? Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Instead of saying, hey, son, you know, it's really cold outside. You want to wear a jacket? No, they go outside, it's freezing. They come inside and say, I want a jacket. When a child's very young, you begin to teach them how to make choices for themselves. But this type of situation, you've never learned to make choices because we're scared of failure. But the new covenant in Christ is internal control, which is the fruit of self-control. So this sanctification as a process is learning how to walk with the Holy Spirit. You can fast as much as you want. You can pray as much as you want. All those things are important. But ultimately what the Lord wants for us to do is obey Him. Yes. He's the one that leads us and guides us, and he's the one that can tell us, hey, that's not good for you. Yes. It's outside of my boundaries of love for you. Um, can you make a choice right. to come near to me and, and not go near to that thing? Is that, is that that's right? exactly it. Okay. But see, that's not what religion does. Religion says, hey, um, if your hair is too long, there's sin in your heart. That's actually an old hymn. Right? So some of you guys here with tattoos, I'm judging that you probably had a past. Maybe you didn't. 
Maybe you just because you know the temple is the Holy Spirit. This is I'm going to go here for you guys. Leviticus chapter 19. It talks to us about not marking our body. What is the context of marking your body in Leviticus 19? Huh? You're all saying the right answers, but it's like, it was a pagan worship. Okay, so we have an older generation that so struggles. I have no tattoos. I have no dog in this fight, right? Because for me personally, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I don't like pain. But anyway, and I'm like, and I don't really have anything I want on my body forever. However, here's where people get in trouble. They go, oh, you darn kids getting all tattered up. Leviticus 19 also says you shouldn't be eating shrimp. So if you're having a shrimp snack and you're judging somebody with a tattoo, it's in the same thing. Leviticus also talks about having labradoodles. How many of you have beautiful little labradoodles? You have your little Pikachus and your Kipus and <laughs> The Bible says not to inter intermingle animals. Some of you right now, you're sitting here and I just can't even look at you. Let me see. Are, your, uh, are, you, are you shaved and rounded here? Oh, my goodness. Are you wearing cotton mixed with wool? Oh, my gosh. Read the context. So what people try to do is external control, thinking that's going to change the heart. Throw off. Reject. All right, I want to move on, but Romans 8, 14, and this was kind of the theme that I came here with, to be honest. The theme I came here with was to really, uh, how do I say this properly, to protect, to warn, to encourage, to not embrace a religious spirit, okay, which says I know everything, and, you know, and uh, Romans 8, 14 says this, those that are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. The word for led in the Greek is the word governed. Guess what? The Holy Spirit wants to govern you. That's a good word, isn't it? I'm free. Whee! Yeah, that's immature freedom. Mature freedom says, I don't want my freedom to be a license for somebody else to stumble. All right? Those that are led by the Spirit govern are the sons of God. The word sons there is the word weos which is mature son. So how do you know if you're walking in maturity is that you're being governed in your life by the Holy Spirit? So I'm not giving people permission to sin. I'm actually saying lordship looks way differently than just having to constantly tell people what to do all the time. Parents that raise their kids like that, one of the first things their kids do when they turn 18 is they're out of there. And we think the father's like that. If the father's like that, he would not have put two trees in a garden. All right. That felt good. Let's move on. We need a break yet? Let's take a bathroom break, because I kind of have to take a bathroom break. Let's take a... <laughs> that would be a good time for a break. Let's take a break, and then we're going to dive in to Song of Solomon. The reason why I went on all this, what seems like a rabbit trail, was because I believe one of the reasons why they've avoided the literal view is because they didn't want to talk about sex in church. Bathroom break.